Greetings, dear listeners. This is Jonah Goldberg, host of the Remnant Podcast, brought to you by the Dispatch and Dispatch Media. I'm actually talking to you on a Saturday, rare Saturday recording. Not that it will make any difference really to the quality of this conversation, except for the fact our guest might be occasionally looking over his shoulder to watch what the score on a game is. As I've told you guys, I'm leaving for vacation and tra- business work, business travel, and my friend and friend of the pod, both friend of the pod in the sense of capital P, John Bedoritz, but also friend of this podcast, uh, lowercase b, uh, David Bonson has a new book out. And I am, I'm a firm believer that books need friends and friends' books need friends. And this is an exciting and interesting book. And we might actually have some fun disagreement. I'm not sure. It is called Full-Time Work and the Meaning of Life. Also, David Bonson is like head of, it's not since, people hate this joke, but not since Lou Gehrig got Lou Gehrig's disease has there been a bigger coincidence than David Bonson being head of the Bonson financial something or other. He's has he's a scrooge mcduck guy he's in the national review family and uh welcome back good to be back i think we're i think we're at uh number seven number seven episodes yeah i I believe so and this is number four book is that right yeah because i don't count the elizabeth warren book because uh, my book ended her campaign so quickly that's right that it was sort of came and went but yeah this is uh the fourth the fourth book of substance yes and also the elizabeth warren book it was such a screed that there was no punctuation. So technically it wasn't a book. <laughs> I yeah. kid, I kid. <laughs> um, speaking of John Podoritz, it goes in a nice sort of category of with John Podoritz is, can she be stopped? Yeah. Um, going into 2008, where the answer was yes, um, about Hillary Clinton in that book. Right. Okay. There, there's a few out there, and I actually learned I'll never, I'll never do a political book again. For one thing, because I don't want to do a political book. Yeah. But particularly something that is pertinent to timing and the political cycle. When I, when my publisher came to me and said, "You really need to do this," the, Elizabeth Warren was at sixty-one percent in the polls, and it was October of two thousand and nineteen. I go and put the book together. It's very topical. It's like a chapter on energy and a chapter mm-hmm. on the wealth tax and commentary actually published in the magazine. My, my chapter on the wealth tax as a, a kind of standalone type thing, Graham. But basically the chapter, um, I mean, the, the book, yeah, the, by January it came out and then her campaign was done a week later. So I learned that lesson. I think Hugh Hewitt had that happen to him once with Mitt Romney as well. I think that's right. And then Jonathan Shait had that book about Obama's legacy that 90% of the argument, as I understand it, was contingent upon Hillary Clinton getting elected and solidifying um, Obama's executive orders and and all the rest. And then that didn't happen in 2016. That's why I write books like Suicide of the West, because suicide is a multi-generational process. Yeah. Um, by the way, I just got a copy of Suicide of the West in Chinese. I think it's for the Taiwan market, just to be clear, but yeah. it's kind of cool. How, what, is liberal fascism in a lot of languages? Yeah, it's in quite a few. The most notable ones it's not in are, are Italian and German. Uh, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> yeah, I, um, I kind of think that's fun. I've had uh, my No Free Lunch book now is in Japanese and Korean, and there's a few different languages and so forth. Um, but I haven't yet had a, uh, let's see, G- yeah, G- I guess German and Italian haven't happened for me yet either, but yours for a very different reason. Probably for different reasons, yeah, yeah. All right, so we've actually violated the first rule of having authors on here, but uh, I think people understand because we're just chatting on a Saturday. What's your book about? Well, basically, the whole message um, about work being the meaning of life is somewhat controversial until someone reads the book and they get the context better. But it is an attempt to kind of bridge the different passions I have in my life, um, economically, culturally, and then theologically. And I think my faith is cut through in all my books, even in the case for Dividend Growth, which is a clear investment book. There is something for those theologically trained enough, um, even in that book, that one could extract my faith presuppositions from. But this book is really quite explicitly theological in certain elements. And yet at the same time, I'm responding to what I consider to be a cultural crisis. And it's not one that is foreign to people. I just think how bad it's gotten within the church and what the real causes of this mess are, I think has become a real, a real crisis. And so 
Uh, the book is making a, a case for an end to the sort of cultural tone about work that speaks to it apologetically, speaks to it uh, defensively, it speaks to this idea of careerism as a negative. Um, the, the Atlantic wrote a big piece a few months back just wondering what we're going to do about this awful uh, pandemic of people that are, are so uh, devoted to their work, finding their identities in their work. All the while, we're sitting with men in prime working age, the same percentage of which are now working or looking for work as were during the Great Depression. So I'm just not buying it. Okay, I know you're going to take this in the in the spirit of of love and kindness in which it was intended. I feel like you answered the question in anticipation of criticisms rather than the forthright positive case that you're trying to make. So let's let me try this again. Why should work be central to people's lives? Um, because that's what God made us to do. God did not make us to wake up and be in love but we are to be in love. He didn't make us to wake up and enjoy Chinese food and steakhouses, but we certainly ought to do that. He made us for the purpose, the telos of production. Um, and he did this because he is a worker and a producer, and then he made man in his image. And he effectively asked us to go build civilizations, which requires work, to be creative, to make things that are true, good, and beautiful. And all of these things are synonymous with the concept of work. The actual Hebrew word used is the same word used for worship. This is the way in which we uh, express communion with God, is in our work activities. And I go both Old and New Testament. Um, the, I believe that man was made for this purpose. And that when we get to a point of looking at work as an economic necessity only, um, I think work is an economic necessity. I think that there is a baseline by which someone says, okay, a really good reason to work is because if you don't, you're going to starve. But I don't think that covers the entirety of why people ought to work. When um, people in the conservative right, when people who are just kind of from the school of hard knocks, or when people have faith, attempt to defend work only on the basis of how good it is to be responsible and get up and get a paycheck so you can make your car payment. Um, they haven't necessarily said anything wrong, but they've most certainly said something incomplete. And what I'm trying to do is deliver a complete message on work that when all is said and done, if it were adopted, would not allow us to fall into a European welfare state version of work, would not allow us to fall into, I think, a very elite and snobbish understanding of work that, that idolizes corner office white collar people like me, but looks down on people doing physical labor. Um, I think that there's a whole lot of benefits that would come from us just getting back to the essence of what God made us for, which is to work. One of the things you didn't like necessarily about my book, even though you understood where I was coming from, was the first sentence about how there's no God in the book, right? And then he sneaks in at the end. And my, my defense of that has always been that arguments from authority only work on people who recognize the authority that you're citing, right? So I can't, if we're two kids and you're my brother and I say, you can't do that, he says, who says this? His dad says so. You're going to listen because I'm telling you what dad thinks. If you're a complete stranger and I say, my dad says you can't do that, you're going to say, who the hell's your dad, <laughs> right? And so the, what is the argument or do you have one for people to consider work central to their lives? Uh, not to the exclusion of other things. I mean, I was, I've been reading your book. You know, you, you're not for sidelining your family or anything like that. No, I make it very clear in my book that I love both or all three of my kids, however many it is. I liked all of my kids. The argument that this is what God wants you to do only right. works on people who credit that, that authority. What is yep. your argument for work for someone more secular or someone of a different faith or... Right. Okay, so first, let's just do the epistemological thing, because that's kind of what you do best on this podcast is geek out on this stuff. And it's really what I live for, um, which is why I got so many chicks in high school. <laughs> Jonah, if, if somebody says, I need you to make an argument for something, but um, not by the standard you've talked about, which is God, but by a different standard, and I do so, all that means is I've changed my God from the one I was appealing to, to them. I've just made them God. Their standard 
by which I believe in certain things has to itself meet the basic preconditions of intelligibility. Why should somebody believe in work as dignified or believe certain things that I believe about human nature um, as rooted to theological convictions? Because I'm upholding that as the standard. And, and if there is a different standard, then somebody who holds to a different standard might want to write a different book about work. But I don't believe that free enterprise is totally defensible apart from the basic presuppositions and, again, these conditions of intelligibility that I think are rooted in transcendent truths. And so I am um, really sympathetic to the point you make that if someone, that therefore a lot of people just say, well, I don't identify a Christian faith, so I throw this out. But what I'm trying to do is use theological arguments to make a philosophical point mm -hmm. that philosophically, I believe mankind was made to work. And there is a rich tradition in psychology. I think one of the things I like a lot about what Arthur Brooks did is make a very, very similar argument. His whole mm -hmm. concept of earned success. Right. Um, he is definitely rooting it to the same biblical anthropology and belief about the human person as made in the image of God that I am. But he made the argument without putting that front and center. And fundamentally, all we're talking about is why these things are true. So I could say work is important because we're more dignified. We have more self-worth. We feel better about ourselves. We uh, um, achieve certain uh, peaks and valleys in life that then become very rewarding. All of those things are true. And I don't have to say God for them to be true. But because I only believe they're true because of God, I'm just trying to do something that I think is more epistemologically grounded. Okay, so I think that is a entirely defensible and good answer, and I want to be really clear about something. There is more than enough room in life and in these arguments to make the arguments that you want, right? And so you don't have to, if you don't want to, you don't have to give the Buddhist argument for why you should make work the center of your life. You don't have to give the secular argument for why you want to make work the center of your life. And I think what you're doing is an important thing is to sort of remind a lot of Christians and Jews and people of the Judeo-Christian faith, that um, taking work seriously is consistent with their faith and their traditions and, and what God wants them to do. And that's more than enough. That said, I'm not sure I agree with you <laughs> um, in the sense that where you say, if you're asking me to make the case, if I'm asking you to make the case for, for work absent God um, or absent appeals to the authority of God, all, what I'm asking you to do is to change the definition of God from God to me. I'm not sure I buy that. That might have some, you know, sort of Nightingale song resonance in Christian theology that I'm, I'm maybe missing a little bit. But I think, put it this way, kosherism is not expressly and purely a dietary law about hygiene and healthy living, right? It is a covenant with God and all that kind of stuff. But there are arguments for kosherism that you can make absent appeals to biblical authority or, or godly authority just because like you can make the argument that eating pork, particularly eating pork or bottom feeders in second century Mesopotamia is probably not a good idea. <laughs> and and I don't think you see there's an inconsistency there, right? Because Well, no, but what Christian theology has always had a very easy way of dealing with this. And in in Romans one, um, we talk about the things. I happen to believe some of the best workers, some of the people who have lived out the message of my book, entirely reject the premises. Mm -hmm. And 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 what I mean by that is, and you you've used an analogy before. It may have been Kevin Williamson, but like what, this thing about the elites, and we're so against elites, and then we have to have open heart surgery, and we want like an elite right. heart surgeon. I think that there are people that say I'm against God, and I think that work is us living out what we were created for. And I think there's a whole bunch of people that are living out what they were created for without acknowledging what they were created for. And in Christian theology, we call it common grace. Mm -hmm. There are people who don't believe in the particular redemptive grace message of the cross and the gospel and, and the whole story of Christian theology, but do um, live like it to some degree. Yeah. They get up, they're married, they're ch there's these... They're decent people. Uh, Catholics yeah. have an easier time because they appeal to this thing called um, natural law that I, mm -hmm. I don't really find as convincing as a lot of my Catholic friends do. I don't believe 
that in nature we get the entirety of this revelation necessary for a holistic worldview. But I think I think that what you're saying is correct, that people can make really good pragmatic arguments for work, but I don't believe that ultimately those arguments are convincing philosophically when they're not rooted to some created truth. Therefore, we you end up having to kind of discuss what people's beliefs about created truths are. Mm-hmm. And, and so for me, it is something I'm just content to do in economics is... And I think with economics, we've seen what happens when the right decides to go full secular mm-hmm. and then say, and then pretend Ayn Rand is one of us. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden the financial crisis comes and everybody goes, well, maybe we need Bernie and AOC after all. Um, I don't think that uh, the, the defense of markets works all the way without rooting it to some sort of understanding of the human person that's going to require a theological conviction one way or the other. With, with work, um, a big part of this, the reason is that the book was in, largely written for believers. I'm suggesting that the church is getting this all wrong. Mm-hmm. And so I know that you don't spend a whole lot of time Sunday mornings going into evangelical churches. I'm sure you've been in some, but you mm-hmm. know, the, like the, well, Sunday after Sunday, it may not be what you're doing, but see, for those who are, I think they're getting something often very dangerous. I think they're getting a pastor to sort of sacralize this message that your work is a necessary evil mm-hmm. or that your work is something to do to support the church building fund, to provide for your family, but that really at the end of the day, um, if they're speaking to kind of upper middle class middle-aged successful professionals. They're trying to give them some existential meaning for the next phase of their life outside of work. And if they're talking to young people, um, they're often really reinforcing, I think, this awful message that we're all entitled to a work-life balance, whatever that means. And so it is very dualistic. It is dividing our lives between the sacred and the secular. And that, and and so I have to kind of take a theological approach to be able to tackle those enemies, which were the enemies I was writing the book against. Okay, so I want to circle back to all of that, but I want to give you a chance to make again the positive case. So what you know, what is the scriptural, biblical argument for work being central to your life? What is it? Is it? Is it, is it I. I mean, I, I've. I, I know part of your answer, but I want you to give it on your terms rather than me paraphrase it. Well, if um, so, obviously you you understand the Christian theology of creation and then the fall, a doctrine yep. of original sin, Adam you. and Eve, and all that, and then redemption, and that mm-hmm. I believe we're living in this period again. Unlike my Jewish friends, as a Christian, I believe that at the point of cross you know, Christ achieved this redemption, and now we're living out this redemption in history. And eventually we end up in new heavens and new earth and all that good stuff. So that's kind of basic Christian theology that people could either like or dislike. But at the very beginning of it was that creation thing. And so to answer your question, I think that out of the initial creation, Genesis chapter one, verses 26 through 28, which to my knowledge, all Christians and Jews would agree with, that God um, said, that he made us to have dominion over the earth, to cultivate the earth, to steward it, and that we were in charge over the other elements of the created order, the animals, the plants, the mountains, the air, and all those good things. And then you get just a few more chapters in Genesis, sin happens, and the the kind of, you know, real key covenantal issues with Adam and Eve. But then all of a sudden, Genesis 4, 5, 6, like, so there's thousands of people. Civilization has taken place. Mm-hmm. People that were created went out and built and did things. And the word we would use for that is work. And, and that was out of a commandment God gave before there was sin. The reason he was making Adam and Eve. And he said, before sin, he repeated it with the Ten Commandments, but he said before sin that he worked for six days and rested on the seventh and asked us to be image bearers of him, to be imitators, but that we shared this characteristic with him. And that was because he made us with this dignity. Uh, He loves the human beings he made in a special way. 
And that's why Christians believe in a particular possibility of relationship with God. And so there's always the transcendent and the imminent. There's things that we share with God and things we don't. But one of the things we share with God is his capacity as a worker and a creator and a producer. And so if I, and this is an if, when I get to teach supply side economics, I don't start with Laffer's curve and I don't start with marginal tax rates. I fundamentally believe in supply side economics because I believe that we were created to produce and therefore I desire public policy that seeks to remove impediments to production. I also believe in work because of the same concept that where I think Keynes went most wrong was believing that we were made to consume, where I think when I read Genesis 1 and the very initial passage dealing with God creating humankind, I think it's very clear that he made us to be a very productive, laborious, and and creative uh, part of his creation. I think it's fair to say we both like, maybe not every day, and in every way, but we both like what we do for a living pretty clearly. We might change the portfolio of time spent on some things versus other things, but at the end of the day, I think we both feel like we've kind of lucked out. But we also fall into a pretty narrow slice of work. What do you say to people who don't, who have jobs that don't necessarily offer rich financial incentive, you know, financial rewards, psychic rewards, social rewards, status rewards. I mean, you got more financial rewards than I do. I have, you know, um, but I get good psychological rewards because I just get to do what I want to do in terms of writing and, and I get, I have, you know, all that kind of stuff, right? I used to have nice status, but there are people <laughs> doing uh, really crappy, not great compensated jobs what do you say to them to, I mean, other than this is what the Bible wants you to do? Like, why, 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 what, what makes this a compelling argument for, for them? Yeah, it's going to be the, the most frequently asked question about the book, and it is more or less what I want the book itself to address, because I do believe you're exactly right that um, those various categories of benefit are benefits that have accrued to us. Now, I know most of your story as well, um, and I know that, you know, the, the position you've enjoyed as an author and public thought leader and whatnot, there were certainly moments earlier in your career where there was still more of a hustle to and chase and building mm -hmm. up of, of your, your uh, credibility and, and achievements and, and pedigree. And, and, you know, in my case, um, I want my story to, I hate the fact that it's sort of biographical. There's nothing egotistical about this. But like, I'm glad that uh, there's two types of hedge funders, Jonah. There's really successful hedge funders that came from an outer borough and a blue collar family, and they just live their lives with the biggest chip on their shoulder you've ever seen. Mm -hmm. And then there's those that went to Harvard and their dad went to Harvard and they happen to be brilliant people. Mm -hmm. I have no problem with either one of them. They're, they're a very successful hedge funders. They're generally one of the two. And in my particular case, I've achieved an economic success, a professional success um, that came despite my conditions, not because of them. I had my dad die when I was basically starting adult life and my mom was already gone and there was no money and, and it, you just kind of feel like you're entering the world all alone and certainly entering the world um, poor because you are but not poor in the sense of living on the street. So, you know, I, it's all relative. But um, it, to me, there's this sort of element of, I don't look back on when I was working at the sandwich board at Togo Sandwich Shop as this negative, awful thing because I was doing what I had to do to pay the bills while I was trying to build for something different into the future. And so you notice at the beginning of each chapter of the book, we start with this cute little thing of the various jobs I've had throughout my life, starting age 12, when, you know, my, my dad said he wouldn't buy me a Commodore 64 computer. And but if I wanted to pay for it, I could get it. And so I went out and mowed lawns and washed cars. And, and I bought a Commodore 64 computer. Um, though it's not meant to say, look at me, I worked hard. And now I'm this wonderful, you know, success story. It's meant to, first of all, make an argument that 
I really think our disdain for teenage employment today is a terrible idea. No, oh, I agree with that entirely. Yeah. And, and and so from both teenage years into kind of my my young twenties and 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 having to do the things I had to do to build into a, a better career, I think that um, outside of my own story, the the cliche we have is New York, uh, someone making it on Broadway. Um, I think that them w- being a waitress in in Manhattan while they're trying to get their break on Broadway, I think it's one of the most beautiful metaphors for you know what you do as a dreamer and a reacher and a climber in an aspirational society known to mankind because they're doing it knowing that there is not a huge chance of success and that when certain success comes, it may not even be economic. It may just be you get to do this wonderful thing of singing, dancing, and acting that you love doing, and it may not make you a ton of money, but you're just going to do it anyways because you love that thing. I love that story. But to the extent, this is a very long answer to your question, I really believe Arthur Brooks's work here is very important on those grounds of the earned success. Mm -hmm. Those jobs you don't like matter as stepping stones to other things that you may achieve in your life you like more. So journey, not destination kind of stuff. But even apart from that, for someone who is going, their skill level, their education level, their circumstances, they're going to clean hotel rooms. I think you stay in nice hotels when you travel. We've talked about this. I, I stay in nice hotels. There's not a lot of things I'm super snobbish about, but that I like I do prefer nice places. But I um, tip big at hotels, and a lot of people don't do that at all because mm-hmm. um, I think about what those poor maids have to do yeah. going and cleaning those rooms, and it's just it just horrifies me to think about some of the things they walk into. But most maids in hotel rooms are, are not going to another job. That's what they do. They do it sometimes for decades. And I have an answer for why I think they ought to love that work. And it is because, and I quote Pope John Paul II heavily in the book, um, I believe that work is important because the subject of the work is important. And the subject of the work is the worker. And the object of the work, who that hotel maid is working for, or who dispatch is serving with their content, or who the Bonson Group is serving with with, uh, wealth advisory services, the object is second. That in the eyes of God, the worker themselves is important. And I believe that uh, maid getting paid to clean hotel rooms. She's producing goods and services that meet the needs of humanity. That's why it has value in the marketplace. But um, existentially, there is service, there is dignity. And um, I think that God views that work as just as important as he does uh, political punditry and and economic analysis. So let me just ask you, because for my own clarification, I I don't even know if this is pushing back. Is it in your view that God values that work as much? Or that God values and that we should value, right? Because that's sort of the point is you're supposed to, what God values, we're supposed to value too. Um, Is it that God values the effort, the pursuit of excellence, integrity, the things, the things put into it rather than the actual work in the economic sense? Yeah, that's exactly, it's a hugely important thing because this critique that you're not making, but that others are making is that markets distort this message because they place different price value on different outputs. And it's a terrible argument because of the obvious category confusion. What I am saying is that markets will price certain things that take place that are work, the the maid, the, the lawyer, whatever the case may be. There will be different value in economic terms in the marketplace because of subjective value um, and and the skill level and 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 uh, experience and things like that that go into it, and at the same time, in the category of dignity, that God and what you said integrity, the the, um, the work ethic, all those different elements, that God is no respecter of persons. So I don't view this remotely contradictory to say that God views the maid and the lawyer at the same um, place spiritually and that the market prices the value of what the lawyer does differently than the value of what the maid does. 
And so market forces cannot be held to a standard of um, spiritual significance or ontological significance. But what is the basis for me believing that the maid and the lawyer have equal value in the eyes of God? It is my theology of the human person. The worker is a single human made with dignity, a, a maid at, at the Sofitel Hotel in, in Midtown and a corner office lawyer. They are a single individual made by God with dignity. And their work, one will command 25 bucks an hour and one will command perhaps $1,000 an hour. And yet, I believe God views the subject of that work the in the subjective sense that Pope John Paul talked about equally. Right. I mean, it's, I mean, the one way I would think about it is that virtue is virtue. And we can have different, defi- there are different definitions of virtues. There are different definitions of vices out there. It's always fun to look up the different lists. The old Protestant work ethic of industry, honesty, integrity, hard work. That speaks to the individual who conducts themselves that way. It doesn't speak to whether they're a farmer or a lawyer or a doctor, right? It's, 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 it's sort of like in football, play the man, not the ball. It's like, God's watching how you conduct yourself, not watching how you, how much of a paycheck you get. And so I agree with you that applying yourself with integrity and decency and, and, and all the rest in the realm of work is self-justifying um, because, in, in your terms, because that's what God intends for you, for, you to do, for you to do. But I also just think there really shouldn't be separate spheres of your life where you don't operate with honesty and integrity. Right. You know, it's not, you know, when, I, when I'm in Cleveland, I can lie. You know, it's like, that's not how you view these things, you know, or it's like, if I'm doing business with a gypsy, of course, I'm going to lie. You know, you're like, you can't have that attitude because the, 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 the sin and the transgression applies to your behavior, not the, the medium of exchange or the victim or any of those other things. Well, and so uh, similarly that like, it's actually such a joke. They make a TV campaign about it, right? What happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, but decent people don't actually think their marital vows are suspended when they go to Vegas. Um, And I would, uh, your, your point is exactly the same concept as that, that our work ought to be of a certain standard of excellence and drive and service. Um, I think it's a really valuable characteristic of how we get along with coworkers and how we get along with uh, vertically uh, superiors, managers that we don't necessarily always like or agree with. And then how we, um, the externality of customers and vendors. See, in almost any job, you have all the above. And yet in one case, it could be a law firm. In another case, it could be blue collar. But the point is still a lot of opportunity for interaction with neighbor. And, it, and those rules in, in Christian ethics aren't suspended from one job to the next. And, and I think that's a very important lesson. But see, the problem with this, the, the question that um, I think people struggle with in the faith and work movement is that we will understandably see certain societal achievements when someone builds a great business and that results in the invention of the iPhone or, or some just monumental um, glorious success. And it will con- always speak to the fact that there are lower skill uh, uh, jobs out there that don't uh, give us the same kind of opportunity for grandeur. And I don't know of another way to make the case for the sort of democratization of dignity apart from the way God views the subject in each case of that work. But then I don't feel constricted there by um, therefore saying that the pay won't be different, the economics won't be different, or that one person might say, I'm actually striving to do something different. While I, my pastor in New York was a butcher mm-hmm. while he was you know, getting his theological training. And he, and he talks about how he wanted to be the best butcher he could be and, and cut meat to the glory of God. And people say, oh, this seems kind of silly. Who really cares how you're, you're cutting up the meat? But the funny thing in Christian theology is the Bible does. That, was the, that isn't language I'm extracting to kind of pretextually make a case. Paul said, whatever you eat or drink, do all to the glory of God. Like he was the one who wanted this to be encompassing of all of these different elements. And I think that the snobbishness of the way we view the workforce now 
is a byproduct of secularism. Uh, of the, and the, the material, this is something, again, I borrowed heavily from Arthur Brooks. The materialism in this stuff that, well, certain jobs are important if they pay more, that isn't the Christian view. The, 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 so, that someone else came up with this idea that the person has more meaning if they are paid more. And so what I want to do is all at once repudiate that idea, reinforce the dignity of the worker, the, the value of the work subjectively, and at the same time, beg Christian pietists and evangelical fundamentalists to quit saying things like the pursuit of the corner office is a bad thing. Mm -hmm. Because I actually believe that we need more people reaching for the corner office, that in this case being a metaphor for some form of vertical mobility, better achievement, better success in their uh, vocational endeavors. Okay, so let me, let, me, let me ask it this way. I mean, I have my answers to this question, but I had to deal with hospice nurses when my mom died. One of the things that you, you pick up almost immediately from people who are hospice nurses is if they weren't suited for it, you'd never meet them because it is a, it really is a calling that if you're not suited for it, you quit really quickly. It's like being a pediatric cancer ward nurse. It's like either you've got that thing that lets you handle the tragedies and the emotions of it, or you don't, right? But I think we can both agree they're doing God's work. I mean, like, there's a view out there, obviously it's not yours and it's not mine, but there's a view out there that a more rightly oriented society would pay people like that a lot more money than it pays people who are programming the next Call of Duty um, video game. And yet it doesn't. What is your answer to people who, who, who make that case? Well, I, I do believe that there's a category distinction here that I can help with, and um, yet I understand where it comes from. I'm, I'm empathetic, yet um, it's, I think price discovery is very important, and people need to understand what they're saying when they suggest that the way a market set a price is somehow inadequate. Um, I, it may very well seem to us, especially experientially, you, you've dealt with the, the nurses when, when your mother was ill, and I remember dealing with the doctors when my father passed, and you build a, a real understanding of the incredible work they do. People, the most uh, cliche example that people use are teachers, right? Mm -hmm. like, uh, and so I get that, um, especially parents, you know, they get so tired with their kids and they see this third grade teacher dealing with 28 year olds every day, and you just think, oh, they should make you know, half a million dollars a year. I can't imagine right. dealing with 20 kids all day. But um, at the end of the day, Jonah, what does someone mean when they suggest that market prices and the free exchange of goods and services that lead to price discovery out of a subjective theory of value, what do they suggest is a better way to set the price of how, what we will pay nurses? They just, the only other option is that person getting to be God for a day. And I like I may hate a movie and go, I can't believe that Brad Pitt got 25 million or George Clooney got 25 million for that terrible movie. But what is far worse than George Clooney getting overpaid for one movie or a or a the seventh man on the New York Knicks getting a hundred million dollar contract when he goes on and bombs in his NBA career? What's far worse than that is you or me or this other person getting to be in charge of prices. I don't think that when we're in the category of market clearing activity and freedom of exchange, that there's a better alternative than market forces to select prices. And yet we're very free to just simply say, I don't like, I wish people got paid more. Mm -hmm. You know, I happen to think hotel maids um, do a really incredible work. And so I, I try to put my money where my mouth is a little bit. By, by leaving a C note on the counter when I walk out and so forth. Those things are um, all options, but not price setting that is simply going to be subjectively done to someone else who is effectively wearing the hat of an economic dictator. I'm just trying to figure out if I use the adjective total or near total <laughs> agreement with that. I, I look at it a little differently. I mean, obviously, I think you would agree we are talking about in the big picture here, right? That doesn't mean that this hospital, these nurses aren't being underpaid. And the, the but the market will sort that out if they truly are being underpaid because they'll go to work at a different hospital, right? Vis-a-vis um, -vis where the price should be, right? So that's how the system works. It doesn't mean necessarily doesn't work that way instantaneously everywhere uniformly. Um, 
and that's all fine. So I agree with you on that. One of the things I look at it about at it, and I, I do want to get to this idea of identity. Um, we've probably talked about it before. I'm sure you know about it. One of my favorite examples about how markets make people happier is the candy experiment with kids, where if you have kids, you can ask them what their favorite candy is, right? But then you distribute it randomly to the kids. So some kid, one kid is going to, in a classroom of say 10 kids, so one kid's going to get a Milky Way and he hates Milky Ways. And another kid's going to get a Nestle Crunch Bar and he loves Nestle Crunch Bars, right? But if you have them rate all these things on a piece of paper, and you just give it out randomly, the average happiness in the room is going to be pretty low. If you let them all trade with each other, the average happiness about how satisfied they are with their own choices goes from like a five to like a nine because one kid gets to trade the candy bar that he doesn't like for the kind of candy bar that he does like. There's a similar argument to be made with the labor force. It is much murkier than the candy argument because there are people, because of contingency, uh, inherited problems, cultural problems, barriers to entry, intergenerational wealth problems. You know, there are all sorts of more serious sedimented problems. But at the same time, the kind of person who wants to be a pediatric cancer ward nurse and discovers they have a gift for it is going to get a lot more out of it than if we had a system that randomly assigned people jobs like they were candy bars in that experiment, right? Like a misfit, I would be so miserable trying to do your job. I don't like math. I don't like talking to clients. I don't like, I don't like the humans generally. Um, I, I would prefer your paycheck to my paycheck. But like there are lots of jobs that I could get paid a lot more money to do, but I would be less happy. I would get less satisfaction. And so for me, it's, I agree with you entirely about the price setting thing. But what we're really talking about, if you take those kinds of arguments seriously, is to have status satisfaction setting going on too, where we're going to dis decide how what will make people happy. And those things are embedded, but those things are also embedded. They're also a price input, Jonah, because there's a there's so many people that get happiness from being a teacher because they're naturally programmed to love kids and they love you know this idea of of development of first grade and third grade and all this kind of stuff. And so the supply and demand factors that do Im uh, impact prices. Um, are heavily influenced by the fact that there's an awful lot more people who want to be third grade teachers. And there's a certain persona of a person who wants to be a third grade teacher. It doesn't require a PhD. It doesn't require a lot of negotiating skills. It doesn't require advanced math and lawyering and medical school. So there's a little bit lower barrier to entry with a high supply. And those are inputs into the price discovery. And yet that high supply is a byproduct of a happiness aspiration that fits in. And then very candidly, it's work that um, I wouldn't want to do. I doubt you would want to do it. And yet it isn't work that is at that level of uh, sacrifice. Summers are generally off, for example. Mm -hmm. um, you know, aside from maybe some light paper grading or that you don't really grade papers at third grade. But like, you know, you're more or less clocking in, clocking out. Now that work from 8.30 in the morning till three in the afternoon, kids yelling and, and, and just all that kind of chaos, I'm sure it, it wouldn't be enjoyable. But, but the price setting that goes around it ends up becoming more rational and, and efficient over time. But the other thing too, now that we're kind of geeking out more economically than, than on the theological side, we, when you look at the nurse example, and people just make the kind of cosmological statement that nurse should be paid more than mm -hmm. the person doing this thing. I wonder how much they're willing to look at what the healthcare bureaucracy costs are that impact that nurse's wages. What is our give? What is our margin for increasing the compensation to nurses if we weren't spending $2 trillion a year on healthcare bureaucracy? Mm -hmm. Um, uh, I, David Brooks just had a piece in the New York Times suggesting that one third, and it was, he was extracting it from a book. I don't remember the author's book. It was a Harvard study, but a third of healthcare costs go into paperwork. Mm -hmm. okay. So, so even there, I don't think markets are usually the worst culprit. There's all, there's other explanatory for, factors, but, but I think your point about the, the happiness side is very true. I look, I happen to deal with a lot of academics. And I deal with a lot of hedge funders. 
And I, every now and then, will have academics say that they wish they could get a little piece of this, this uh, finance stuff that we have. And yet, when I look at the hours work, the, the stress, the pressure, the externalities of what goes in, I assure you that those people who would like the paycheck of one versus the other are not counting the cost mm-hmm. of, of the risk reward profile. That, that goes into it. I don't think markets misprice these things as much as we say, but I do think there are moments where emotionally it's an incredibly understandable thing to say, I wish that person made more and I think that person's overpaid um, and, and I get it completely. But I, I, I just, I think it has to be done in the context of all these other things we're talking about. No, I agree with that. I agree with that. Um, I want to read this quick thing from the introduction. Uh, you write, the default view of secular culture and the church has been that our identities are not tied to what we do. Our value as humans, we are told, is unconnected to any aspect of what we offer society vocationally, professionally, or productively. Our identity and value exist in some ethereal realm separate from physical and metaphysical reality. This is, of course, utter nonsense. We don't hesitate to define our heroes by what they have done, and for good reason. The idea that a person can be metaphysically separated from what they do and have done is fantastical. Just before I come at you on this, because I agree with you, but, uh, you know, when you talk about identity, how do you think about identity? Just what is identity to you? Well, I think that there is um, an easy way to say it, that um, who we are it is more than what we do, but it is not less than what we do. That the idea, um, it, it's like whenever people say, I want someone to be able to live however they want to live. And then you go to the kind of Hitler example. Like, do you think people should be able to be like Hitler? Like, no, I don't believe that. You go, okay. So all I've been able to do so far is establish that you don't really believe what you just said, but now let's reel it into where where your line is. Yeah, where are your limiting principles? Yes. Right. And and so when someone says what someone does has nothing to do with who they are, it is not a part of their identity. And I ask them, do you look at a person tirelessly working, diligent, making sacrifices, treating people ethically, and, and succeeding in some entrepreneurial or service endeavor and you look at a 30-year-old laying on a couch, smoking pot all day, never getting up, do you view them as the exact same? Or do you view them differently? And is the reason you view them differently because of what they each do? And, and if they're going to lie in their answer, I guess there's no point in continuing the conversation, but the answer is so cockamamie obvious that I'm shocked we have to have the societal conversation that there's something more impressive about a highly successful achieving person and a couch potato pothead. And so then where do we get into it? Then then you start moving in a little bit and saying, well, am I supposed to look at that lawyer versus maid thing differently? But see, at that point, I'm, I'm, all I'm talking about is identity as, as what somebody does and that if someone is a terrible husband, they are identified as a terrible husband. And then if they become a better husband, they improve, they change, they grow. Maybe it's within the same marriage in which they were not doing a good job. Maybe it's later in life in a different marriage. But they, I believe in redemption. I believe in change. But my point being that in that moment, one's identity is a byproduct of objective facts about them, what they do. And I don't think that there's anyone who disagrees with that other than the fact that there's a certain discomfort to the um, cosmetic. It do, it's, it does, I understand people don't like the way it sounds that you are what you do. Um, but because I'm not tying this to socioeconomic sh- status, um, I don't think it should be troubling. I think it should be very intuitive. I agree with this. You know, look, there's this to a certain extent. Um, I might phrase it differently, but we're only on this earth on average about 4,000 weeks. And the way you judge people is, first of all, I, we talk, we're talking about category confusion for it, right? So like, I, I just got into an argument with somebody in the comments at the dispatch who didn't like the recent G-file and was saying how 
um, of course, if you don't believe in biological differences between uh, groups, then any disparities in outcome have to be the result of racism. And I reject that because it's a very common argument. It's this sort of this, it's Abram Kendi's argument is like, since there are no, no group is better than any other group, therefore any disparities have to be attributed to institutional racism or something. And just, my view is who says, Yeah. right? Because the, for the first order category error is the idea that we're all born equal and is true, but we're equal in the eyes of God and government and therefore government right? That we all have innate human dignity. But we're not all born the same. Right. And we're not all raised the same. And, you know, you and I were not born with an aptitude that could have gotten us into the NBA or into the ballet or, you know, a lot of other things. But we were born with aptitudes that did lend themselves to the path that we were on. And there are people in the ballet and in the NBA who were born without those aptitudes and couldn't do what we do. That's fine by me. And, and so I think the category error of thinking that everyone, societies and individuals alike are born tabula rasa, and therefore any disparities have to be attributable to bad acts and bad intentions, I just think is wrong because it misses the diversity of humanity, both in, in groups and as individuals. And the idea that some cultures can't have made more collective mistakes than other cultures seems obvious to me. Yep. Okay, that said, I struggle with this. I've been meaning to write about this for like two years. It is one of the main, like, daydream, what should I write about kind of things that I just never feel like I can get it formulated in my head properly. I have this thing about identity. Um, and I think what you're kind of getting at gets at part of my problem, which is um, there is this idea, this romantic idea, this Rousseauian idea. It's also Marxist. If you actually read Marx, I don't mean like vulgar Marxism. I mean, like we actually believe the most fundamental thing is authenticity, being true to yourself, which is another way of saying that you were born as this metaphysical, spiritual tabula rasa, that there's some ineffable, permanent you buried in there. And that's the thing that you have to be true to at all times and in all contexts. And so like Marx, you remember Marx, his prediction at the end of history, when they truly attained communism was a very romantic one. One could be a poet in the morning, a hunter in the afternoon. You can do all these things. You're not constrained by one job description. You can be all things to all people and true fundamentally to yourself kind of thing. And I think that the problem that we've got and, it's, and what you're getting at is a manifestation of it. And it's sort of making me go back to where your position was about making people God is that we've kind of made people priests of themselves, of their own souls, and that they are the stewards of their own innate dignity and divinity. And anything that constricts who they are is therefore somewhat illegitimate, whether it's work or politics or manners or church or, or, or just rules of good conduct. You know, I got to be true to myself. Right. No, the, the ba institutions and norms. Right. And I think that that is sort of problem. when in reality, the way you judge people is how they, they spend their waking hours during those 4,000 weeks. Right. Are they kind to their wife? And their kids? Are they kind to their husband and their kids? Do they do good work? Do they care about other people? And, and so I see the, the, where I agree with you is that work is really important because it's, it's a big, what is it? It's, it's a, what, 1,800 of those weeks. And the idea that somehow you can keep that separate from who you are is crazy to me. What, where I kind of disagree, or at least with some of your phrasing, is that I increasingly, I don't want to sound Buddhist here. I think we have multiple identities. And I don't mean that we're different, completely different people in different places. But in different institutions, you're a leader. And in some institutions, you're a follower. And there's nothing wrong with that. But that's not a different identity, though. You, you, our views are not going to have daylight between them here, Jonah. We're on the same page. I think that um, there is such thing as a holistic identity that includes different dimensions. And I'm mm -hmm. not being semantic. Um, the identity I have as a father is different than the identity I have as a financial professional. And by the way, my, my career is sort of weird because I get paid to manage money and steward what's become a very large wealth management firm. But I also do writing and speaking and appear on things like The Remnant for, I assure people, no compensation. <laughs> I can assure you too. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it is a part of my identity in the sense that there ends up being some form of a public brand associated mm -hmm. with it, right? Um, 
And, and yet, that to me, it's not about multiple identities. Those are different components that all feed our identity. And what I'm trying to suggest is that one's career is a part of their identity, and it is often a big part of their identity. And, and I just cannot believe that there are people of faith in the, in the Christian community that are uncomfortable with that language, but there are, because they want to be able to say, no, in God's eyes, it just doesn't matter what you do. And it just simply isn't true. There are, to those who much is given, much is required. There are people who have been given certain talents, and one person does a lot with them, and another person doesn't do a lot with them. There are, there's two objective differences. Uh, there's an objective difference between those two different situations. But yeah, I, I recognize the category differences, and and I, I, I'm just not sure you have to call it multiple identities. Mm-hmm. It just seems to me multiple categories or dimensions. Yeah, um, I, I have problems with the multiple identity thing too, but at the same time, I haven't found another word that I like, because I agree with the aspect thing, but like the aspect, different aspects of one identity kind of gets at what I'm talking about, but it it leaves out, like, I think one of the big problems we have that stems from this authenticity garbage is we tell every kid that they're a leader and that they have to be a leader. And I think it's Tom Sowell who makes this point is like, um, if you tell everybody that they're a leader, it's going to be really hard to get people to do their normal jobs, you know? I can't remember what the full quote was. Well, there's a math problem with it. Um, you know, the joke about um, any group of people, how many of you consider yourself to be above average and you're going to get a lot more than 50% who, who right. raise their hand and whatnot. I think people's poor self-perception or self-awareness is, is, is a, a whole different issue, but I'm not sure if it's a good analogy or not. I'm kind of making it up on the spot. If you're familiar much, I know you and I have talked about it on past podcasts, um, Kuyperian thought, who Abraham Kuyper, the old um, prime minister of Holland and was one of the great um, theologians and also political actors and, and, and involved in journalism in Amsterdam in the late 19th century. And I believe him to be the real heir of John Calvin and, the, and in that sense, the Protestant Reformation. So I, I have been heavily influenced in, in my faith by uh, the work of Abraham Kuyper. And he made famous this um, nomenclature called sphere sovereignty, mm-hmm. the, 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 the distinctions between the sphere in public life of church, state, family, individual, these the, uh, so category distinctions. I think in a lot of ways, what we're describing is a sphere separation within the human identity. And that there um, is a vocational or professional sphere that contributes to our identity and that there are other categories that fit there as well but they may function in a in a different uh, category or sphere but but the authenticity issue is, is such a load of horse manure for totally other reasons it first of all presupposes that one can know what their authentic self right. is without the years of vigorous discovery, and that um, their authenticity is not to be formed itself by the very institutions and norms um, that are that they're supposed to be pushing back against in order to find their authentic selves. That isn't, um, for my beliefs about Christian philosophy, that isn't a unique problem. That authenticity issue is more or less back to. Adam and Eve in the garden. That is mankind trying to play God. And the very first commandment was, thou shalt have no other gods before me. This idea that I am allowed to live my life in a pursuit of some autonomous pursuit of authenticity, institutions, norms, manners, and so forth be damned, is uh, dangerously idolatrous and romantic. And romantic. This is one of the things that I have, I mean, I think there's a lot of it in the Jewish tradition, uh, but it's not sp- stated as explicitly as it is in the sort of the Catholic Thomistic tradition of the importance of reason, right? Because like conscience, absent reason, 
is basically instinct. And instincts are corrupting and dangerous, right? If you just act on your gut instincts, there's nothing in Christianity that says, just go with your gut, right? <laughs> there's lots of stuff in Christianity. Well, there's a lot of things in Christianity that say, don't go with your gut. Exactly, right? Because yeah. the world, nature are corrupting and that your, your carnal, primal instincts can be misleading and take you, to, don't give into temptation, all these kinds of things. And so it's not like, the nat there it's not like there are natural things and things about human nature that are aren't good but there are just lots of things that if you just listen to your most basic desires most glandular desires that way doesn't live a lay a righteous life and this authenticity thing when you when you reject all external sources of authority and you reject anyone telling you things that are inconvenient or put work on you to make yourself a better person, and on the grounds that you should just listen to yourself, what you're re what's left is just whatever impulses and urges that you can filter unaided by other people and unaided by arguments from people who came before you. And so, like, I, I'm a big believer in conscience, but it has to be rightly formed conscience, right? This is an intergenerational project to figure out the difference between right and wrong. And this sort of Rousseauian romantic stuff basically just says, no, 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 you're not the boss of me. No one's the boss of me. I can figure it out on my own. It gets very much into sort of Dewey and progressivism about like how the technocrats can figure everything out. But it's, it's like that, but for morality. Uh, well, and I think, I think that that is a, another example of this sort of epistemological challenge for someone like me, that my uh, condemnation of it is specifically rooted to the fact that the expectations I think humans ought to have of one another and of ourselves is rooted to a specific transcendent belief system. And that the Rousseauian notion is only not the utter chaotic mess it could be, because people who have said they buy into it still actually live within certain civilizational walls that right. were built by Christianity and, and the Judeo-Christian tradition. And thank God, right, that there is still some regard for traditions and norms that doesn't lead to the full chaos that a properly ordered, uh, that a, pro uh, excuse me, a fully consistent French revolutionary spirit would bring about. So uh, I know we're going along here, but just the last bit, um, you're going to get accused of it about 98, 99% from people who won't and haven't read the book. But you're going to get accused of being like a prosperity gospel guy. You are not a prosperity gospel guy. This is true. Can you explain? Can you explain what it is and what's theologically wrong with it or how you differ from it? I mean, you've, you've hit, for people who know what it is and know you, they've already got why, but like, I think it's just an important thing to state explicitly. Yeah, so those who believe that there is some promise in the scripture that if you are obedient, you will become wealthy and that the point of the work is that then God will start blessing you with mansions and, and cars. That we're going to find it's going to be very hard for them to find not only in this book but in anything I've ever written. Not not only that, but they're going to have a hard time finding things um, that aren't the opposite of that. Right. Because what I actually state is that there will be many times in life that one will work really hard and not get the promotion, and it will be very disappointing. And yet, in learning to live with the disappointments of life, there is great success. Yeah, and flourishing that comes from being poised and having the character to deal with some of the unfairness and, and dissatisfactions of life. The prosperity gospel promises that there won't be those dissatisfactions because you will just simply be materially rewarded. And my book talks about market mechanisms for how people get paid, not uh, prosperity gospel. My book talks about work being something that is ontologically significant not mere, the material component. Um, this notion of earned success has a lot to do with the way the human mind works in appreciating the adversity that we overcame. And that is very different than saying, I appreciate the fact that I just got a brand new Mercedes. So there's certain material uh, rewards and conveniences that, that, that I like. They've never, I think you'd find for most people that have been um, in an entrepreneurial culture, I think most uh, get a lot more satisfaction 
out of what they've achieved than some of the the fruits from the tree. Um, but but there is yeah the, I I don't even know how to defend against the prosperity gospel example <laughs> be, because it's so far from kind of the world that that I live in and it isn't even really adjacent to any of the theological views or economic views that I hold. Um, there there are certain things that are a little fringe or crazy that uh, that might be considered more adjacent to me than that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> go on <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but but yeah the, the 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 prosperity gospel is i think mostly not even rooted in a wrong theological prescription it's mostly rooted in grift that the people who have taught it were themselves just beneficiaries of uh what it is they were teaching and and uh they they it's sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy if enough people will pay you to tell them that they can get rich by doing a certain thing, then they can get rich by doing that certain thing. Right. And um, it's, yeah, it's like so much today, it's really difficult to separate. Like, I, like I, we haven't done much politics today, thank God. Um, it, it's hard for me in this moment. And I think you and I have talked about this before, because I got to think you feel the same way. I don't know how to respond to a lot of the stuff that we encounter that frustrates us politically. Because I first have to figure out if I even think the person I'm responding to really believes mm -hmm. the BS that they've said. Right. And, and, that, and that's where I feel about prosperity gospels. I think so much of it is, is totally disingenuous. Yeah. I mean, one of the reasons why we didn't talk about politics is one, I wanted to be able to talk about your book. And two, um, since we're recording this on Saturday, I don't know if this is going to air, when this is going to air this week, and it could either be dated or overtaken by events. And so I figured we'd stay clear of that. I mean, if you want to talk about whether or not Taylor Swift is a DOD PSYOP. A real bold of you to bring it up now. I mean, <laughs> uh, but see, like, that's a great example. And I actually think the Wall Street Journal and National Review and the uh, others who, who wrote about it, um, I actually didn't read Nick this week. I wouldn't be surprised if he touched on it. It seems right up his alley. Yeah. Um, I don't think any of the people who said it believe it. Yeah. Not a single one. I and, and what you get is like, do I think some of the people that had wild, wild anti-vax conspiracies, do I think some of them believed it? Maybe. But what I do know is that, and I'm not talking about the people who are against mandates and stuff sure, like that. Sure. I was against the mandates. All of it. I'm talking about people that were saying like, you know, Bill Gates is programming a thing in your arm kind of stuff. I don't, I think that a lot of the people believe it. And that makes it all the more morally inexcusable. But like, as far as I can tell this Taylor thing largely originated with Vivek. And as far as the specific example that the chiefs, the Super Bowl, the NFL, the White House, all in on this thing together to get more muscle out of an endorsement. Nobody in their right mind or no one who knows this guy believes he believes it. And so the idea that he would share something that he knows he doesn't believe with people he knows will then go run with it, it says everything you need to know about this person's character and, 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 and code of ethics. Yeah, so I agree with that about Vivek. I think he's a liar. I think he's a con man and a liar. Um, but I do think there's an important point to make. And, and again, we don't have to really dwell on this because we agree on it. Like, so Sarah Esgrim made this point the other day. She knows lots of very MAGA people, right? More MAGA people than I know personally um, and talks to them. And I assume that you know more people in that universe too. None of them believe it. No one who like touches grass, they can be totally pro-Trump. Like, like nobody in... Yeah, two or three degrees of separation out from either of us believes this stuff, um, which I think is an important thing to keep in mind. It's very much a very online thing. But that said, I think it's metaphorically or, or symbolically consistent with a lot of stuff that is much closer to home, which is that um, there are a lot of people who traffic in lies, but part of the problem with traffic in lies long enough is you stop being able to distinguish between lies and truth. The, the incentive structures get weird, the corruption of your own soul, the corruption of your own psyche, these things, you know, to, to say for five years that you think that Donald Trump is a man of pristine character, a lot of people who started saying it five years ago didn't believe it. At the end of five years, a lot of them do. And this is, you know, a point that you've always made about how cynicism is very hard to maintain over time. You have to sort of like embrace, you have to start believing your own BS. 
there is a real there's a real sickness on parts of the right um where I think there are people who now believe it or think it could be true, right? And therefore it's worth throwing around. And um, and you, you, it's, you see this with like, you know, it's analogous to this. I remember reading this piece about the porn industry 20 years ago and the danger, what happens to people in the porn industry is either they get just become dead inside, right? Um, or they become so disoriented that what titillates them just, constantly has to get ratcheted up more and more but you can't you can't deal in this stuff with such dishonesty and lack of integrity for for that long before you start internalizing it so like i i I think alex jones probably believes more of the stuff he says than we think because you start seeing the world as this choose your own adventure kind of thing and I think it is really, really dangerous for the right to be dabbling with this crap. This is what the 60s new left dabbled with, and they could get away with it because it was the hard left. The right is the side that is supposed to be defending America and existing institutions. And if it says the whole thing is rigged, the whole thing is a con, which is, again, what the new left used to say, um, it leaves no one upholding as a political movement the institutions that make America great in the real sense. and. Um, and I, I'm glad everybody, basically everybody we know has condemned it and rejected it and repudiated it in in the Taylor Swift example, but there's been a lot of indulgence of this kind of thing for a very long time on the right. And it's gotten out of hand. It's gotten way out of hand. And there is, um, the category of, of people who are grifters that are peddling it. And there's the category of people that have, you're describing that over time, their sensibilities have broken down and it's gotten out of hand. But how much do you want to bet I can now bridge these two topics between this conspiratorial extremism and my book, Full-Time Work in the Meeting of Life? <laughs> I think that one of the great antidotes to avoiding kookiness is a job. Yes. And you know why I found the Occupy Wall Street con- belief, the theory of the case about Goldman Sachs conspiring with the the Fed and the this and that, uh, all the things that happened out of 08, why I believed it was all nonsense, because I was there. Yeah. And I was inside Morgan Stanley at a very senior level, and I will assure you that people would be much more horrified by what I saw than what they think. Because what they think is that there were evil puppeteers that were up to no good that were still in control. And the reality is no one had any control of anything. Yeah. And people are afraid of chaos and they take comfort in believing, even if it's an evil actor, that there's someone who has the strings of the universe, that they're uh, the sort of Davos um, World Economic Forum view. There's evil things that happen in the world, but they're often quite impotent people. Mm -hmm. And, And that's sort of my view of the Davos guy. I don't defend the Davos guy. It seems to me there's just a bunch of kooky, uh, secular New World Order stuff that gets said over there, and they never really seem to do very well, or, or first of all, be very good in their predictions, but second of all, move the needle much. But this stuff about the kookiness you're talking about, I'm sorry if this sounds snobbish, but it is largely a sociological epidemic. Mm-hmm. 9-11 trutherism was almost entirely from an online YouTube heavy, disassociated, dissatisfied, disengaged component of society. And when one is rooted into healthy community, healthy family, employed, that was one thing we didn't talk much about, but that that virtuous cycle, you've always talked about it a lot. Marriable people are employable and employable people are marriable. Mm -hmm. These things just work beautifully well together. I don't think you get people with healthy families and healthy jobs satisfying careers or the pursuit of a satisfying career that believe that Taylor Swift right. <laughs> I, mean, yeah. just, I, mean, like, I can't even I, say it. I, I mean, the Taylor Swift thing is so, I mean, like, it's not, uh, uh, to be honest. But the, even the Bush, even the Bush bombed the Trent Towers. Okay? Right. Yeah. I mean, but dear it, God. But the thing is, the Taylor Swift part of it is the more believable of the two parts. The idea that the entirety of the NFL 
no. was rigging games from the beginning to get the to Chiefs there, get the Chiefs to the Super Bowl. Like, I think it was Rich Larry who was saying, "Look, if you're going to do that, at least pick a major media market. Like, you wouldn't do it for the Kansas." No, <laughs> but it's it's a, it does reflect a fascinating view of how they think. Like the the Buffalo Bills defensive linemen work, like how their minds right. work. Like, hey, did you hit the weight room your entire life? And go through this physically grueling thing so that you can enable Travis Kelsey to go marry the cute girl and, and endorse Biden. Was that kind of why you were playing football? Well, exactly. Or like with 9-11 trutherism, the idea that cops, firemen, soldiers, FBI agents, just an enormous number of people were all like, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm in on letting Bush murder all these Americans so we can get the Unical pipeline or whatever that right. conspiracy was, you know. Just well, and, and, and that he, he never was able to plant one fake weapon of mass destruction in Iraq. Right. A right. After being able to take down uh, the, the Twin Towers, what just strike, it's actually been my election 2020 argument forever um, that no one has ever responded to. And it frustrates me to no end because they'll point out there's certain irregularities in Michigan or something like that. And I'll just say, you know, you think this thing was stolen in a mass conspiracy and let's leave out Roger Stone and North Korea and Hugo Chavez, but there's some form of ballot stuffing you think move the needle in Georgia and Pennsylvania and Arizona. I, I just got to ask you, why didn't they take one Senate seat right. while they were at it? Just go get, because the, the four Senate seats, they were winning in the polls. Maine, Montana, what was it? What, uh, North Carolina, Tillis. Mm -hmm. And and um, I'm I'm missing uh, another one. They spent a hundred million to try to beat Lindsey Graham. I think Wisconsin. They they couldn't just win. One, oh, Iowa, Joni Ernst. They couldn't just win one of these Senate seats so that Biden could actually pass and build back better. Right, 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 right. But but that kind of rational interaction with it again, I'm presupposing a rationality that isn't really there. And I and I agree with you. We've used Buckley analogies with uh, John Birch Society and stuff. But that was really, it was kind of crazy and it was definitely evil. But a lot of this stuff right now, I, I don't really know. The incentive structures are different in modern technology. Um, there, there's people perpetrating it. They have a lot of authority. They're talented in their charisma and presentation. Vivek's a good speaker. Tucker Carlson's a good speaker. I just, if they don't believe it, what, is, what are they doing? What is, yeah. I, 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 to me, I am mystified but what good will come of this? And I also believe it is um, feeding on the, some of the worst instincts of people about institutions, you know? It's why, why like, I'm so disappointed in the response around the COVID deal, because I think a lot of institutions and public figures made really big mistakes, and it's gonna take a long time to earn any kind of trust back. But, but see, what happened is that happened at the same time they had all this other crazy stuff going on, and so it gets all mixed together and and all hell breaks loose. And you know what it really does is it leads to me being stuck in a remnant. <laughs> and on that, I want to say uh, thank you, David Bonson. Uh, I should tell listeners that there's going to be a, I was saw in the corner, there's going to be a book launch event at the Union League Club in New York City. You can go look at it on the, there's a link to it at the National Review site. We'll put it in the show notes. For all I know, it'll be sold out by the time you hear this. But uh, there it is. And the book, again, is Full-Time Work in the Meaning of Life by David Bonson. Uh, David, thanks again for doing this. Thanks so much for letting me come on, Jonah. Always have fun. Okay, so uh, David has left the studio. It was great to talk to him. Uh, greetings in the future, because I don't know when this is going to air. And um, um, I will keep it brief because it's Saturday and Adam needs to go. Uh, so thanks for listening. Thanks, David. And I will see you next time. No, you won't. This is a podcast.